So what I did is I went back in on a Rule 60, and I said, look, there's been a mistake of law here, and the judge's ruling had no legal validity because of this particular Nevada statute. And while I was at it, since I was already out there, what I did was I added a cross-complaint, or rather a counterclaim, for fraud. And the upshot of this was is that not only was the judgment set aside, but we got a default against this guy and his girlfriend who tried to pull this stunt for $40,000. And any place that they show up, and let me warn you something, people. If you think for one second that when someone sues you, you can just ignore it and it will go away, be one of the biggest mistakes you will make in your life. Because what will happen is if the other side knows what they're doing is they will do just what I did they will get a default judgment against you. And after a certain amount of time, you cannot get it set aside. And once that default judgment is entered against you, the only way you have out of it is called a bankruptcy. In other words, when they track you down, they will take everything you own. Don't even think about ignoring any type of court process. I mean, I've heard of some of this stuff like non-statutory abatements where you send the paperwork back to them and that's supposed to cure it. Well, in any type of traffic case or anything where the state's involved, the next piece of paper you get is going to be called a bench warrant. Rule 65 is for injunctions. In other words, if you want to put in a motion, you want somebody to do something or stop doing or whatever, uh, you can invoke this particular rule. And what you're going to wind up doing here is asking the court, under this particular rule of civil procedure, I want you to order the other side to stop doing something or to make them do something. And while we're at it, before I, and f before I forget it, if you have a problem in which you have a federal judge who isn't doing what he's supposed to be doing, you go under this rule here in the next higher court. It's called Federal Rule of Appellate Procedure 21, okay? And what that does is that allows you to, to file a petition for writ of prohibition would of prohibition or mandamus to either make a judge stop doing something or to make him do something. We've already filed, oh, I think a couple of these in the Ninth Circuit, and nothing works in the Ninth Circuit. You know, don't even think about moving out there uh, and getting anything done in the federal courts because they don't work. Uh, so they're all Richard Nixon appointees. <coughs> you know, if you think Richard Nixon wasn't a clever dude, the man's been dead for years, been out of the presidency for 23 years, and the federal judges he appointed, starting with Harry Blackman, who gave us Roe versus Wade, they're still on the bench, and there are scads of them out there in the Ninth Circuit. They dominate the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and that's why it doesn't work. It isn't what the law is, it's who the judge is. But anyway, that's how you do it in the other circuits. Finally, we have what's called motion day. That's rule number 78. That's the last one that actually needs to concern you here. And what rule 78 simply does is it gives the local district court the option of saying, okay, we can clean all this stuff off in one day. Um, they had a case in Terre Haute, Indiana. Oh, this was back about 1977, about 20 years ago, where they, they had this judge. I forget who this little weasel was, but he had scheduled every convict's civil rights action under Bivens action or whatever it was, all to be tried on the same day, okay? We're not talking about just a motion. We're talking about, this is for motions. He had scheduled all the trials. Well, we got that stopped with a petition for writ of prohibition up in the Seventh Circuit pointing out that one federal judge cannot preside over 14 trials at the same time on the same day. Some of them think they can. Now, next thing I want to get into, uh, are there any questions on the rules of civil procedure? Well, I'm glad to see that everybody knows it all, okay? Because if I start testing you and you don't know the answers, shame on you. What I'm going to cover next is I'm going to cover constitutional law. And what I'm trying to, going to try to do here, in fact, I've got to locate the doggone thing first. It's down in, let's see, page 1107. What I'm going to do is try to give you some idea of the concepts of what you're looking for because a, a Title 42, Section 1983, uh, and a lot of other parts of the Constitution are where your, your basic um, 
your basic foundation is. For example, if you have a constitutional right that's being violated and you want to sue over it, you want to invoke jurisdiction under either Title 42, Section 1983, or a Bivens action under Title 28, Section 1331, it might behoove you to have some idea of what your constitutional rights are and how this document is supposed to work. <coughs> now, what, and what I'm also going to show you is, is that if there is no way to restrain these people, the Constitution only means something in certain instances. Let me give you a quote here. This is from the Supreme Court, a case called Wallace versus Jeffrey, or Jeffrey, 105, Supreme Court, 2479. And uh, incidentally, I always use, there are three ways to cite a Supreme Court case. I always use the Supreme Court citations rather than the United States Report or Lawyer's Edition for one very simple reason. They started numbering these puppies in 1880. And if somebody tells you, well, uh, these, it's in 104 Supreme Court Reporter, well, if you subtract 20 from that number, that immediately tells you what year it is. If it says 105 Supreme Court Reporter, well, if you subtract 20 from 105, this has to be a 1985 case. It's that simple. So I always use that citation because it allows me to tell just in a, in a heartbeat what year it was adjudicated in. This is a quote by William Reinquist himself. Let me read the quote. As drafters of our Bill of Rights, the framers inscribed the principles that control today. Any deviation from their intentions frustrates the permanence of that charter and will only lead to the type of unprincipled decision-making that has plagued our Establishment Clause cases since. The sad part of this is, he's right, the principles are supposed to control, but this is a dissenting opinion. He was in the minority. In other words, if you have five out of nine of the country's worst ambulance chasers make a decision, no matter how unconstitutional or ridiculous it is, all the other courts will follow suit even though they don't have to. There's a 1910 case called Hertz versus Woodman that you'll find in here that tells you that as late as 1910, the United States Supreme Court was telling the other federal courts that one, you don't have to follow our precedents, and two, you don't even have to follow your own. And what's happened is, is that through this gradual encroachment of the judiciary on the legislative function, now we get a pronouncement from the Supreme Court and we get pronouncements from the Federal Circuit Courts of Appeals, and those are now our laws, and those are what, that's what's adjudicated by our courts, even though that is not what Congress enacted. Unfortunately, Congress is not completely blameless either. Let me give you an idea here. Article 1, Section 1. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. Well. All legislative powers herein granted, those legislative powers are found in Section 8, Clauses 1 through 18. Now, one of the things that they had in the first section, and you'll find this, uh, how many of you here have read the Federalist Papers? Show of hands. One, two, three, four, okay, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, good. Uh, what you'll find is, over and over again, the people who authored the body of the Constitution, let me caution you about something. The Federalists, who went the way of the dodo bird and the dinosaur in 1816, as well they should have, they're the ones who gave us the federal judges, who gave us the alien and sedition law enforcement, though, they were, though that, those laws were in flagrant violation of the First Amendment. In the Federalist Papers, they pointed out over and over again that the only way to make the federal government responsible and restrain it was under this clause, Section 3. The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state chosen by the legislature thereof for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. Well, we fleshed this one with the 17th Amendment, and that is why United States senators today are elected by popular vote, and the state legislatures have no control or no, they are not, unable to restrain the federal government because the fact is, I mean, think about this for a minute. If you were a United States senator, let's say you were from Pennsylvania and you went to Washington, D.C., and you voted for some boneheaded nonsense like the Brady Bill, you think for one minute that the same state legislature is going to send you back for the next six years? You know, not ever. There are approximately seven sections to the Constitution, all right? And what I'm going to do here 
<coughs> is uh, we get to the legislative section. One of the problems with the, uh, the original document was they didn't bother to number the clauses. They, they were numbered later. They just had all this stuff in here and nobody put numbers on them. Uh, section 8 is where they find the authority. And again, the reason that I'm, I'm putting you through all this is because if you pay close attention, what you're trying to do here is you're trying to take this information here and you're, what you're going to try to do is you're going to try to make it apply to the jurisdictional statutes. For example, if you have a constitutional issue, it really helps if you know what the issue is. And that's why, let me give you a background on this and then we'll go to the Bill of Rights. Now, when I said a minute ago I wanted to caution you on the fact that the Federalists gave us the body of the Constitution, it was the Anti-Federalists who gave us the Bill of Rights, okay? Had absolutely nothing to do with the Federalists. They didn't even want it. Alexander Hamilton was dead set against it. But the states would not ratify the Federal Constitution until they had a Bill of Rights. And a Bill of Rights did not spout, you know, it didn't just spring full blown out of thin air. It originally started as a reaction to the tyranny of the Stuarts in 1628. They called it the Petition of Right. They didn't get it enacted then. They had a civil war instead. And when the last of the Stuarts got knocked off the throne in 1688, they called it the Glorious Revolution because nobody got hurt. Well, what they don't tell you in most of the history books is that when William of Orange landed, he also landed with 15,000 men at his back. And by that time, everybody had had it with the Stuarts, so they basically had to, had to bag it. And one other thing about the Stuarts I think is, is interesting to note is that a lot of people talk about tyranny and freedom, and they use all these, these terms and they have no, absolutely no conception of where they originated or what the historical background was. The fact is, what made the Stuarts so hated is they had the worst legal system in the history of England. They, they promoted judges who were so corrupt that it's impossible to describe. I mean, you just cannot describe how corrupt the English judges were under the Stuarts. They had reached a stage by 1688 that the English people absolutely despised their own legal system. And so when William of Orange landed with 15,000 troops at his back, the Stuarts decided it was time to abdicate peacefully. Of course, nobody would fight for him. Uh, and in 1689, because of their experience with the Stuarts, the English Parliament enacted what's called now the Bill of Rights. Actually, most of our Bill of Rights came from the English Bill of Rights from over a century before. Section 8, this is what Congress actually has the power to do. And let me show you how this doesn't work. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, and imposts, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. Do you see anywhere here where it says that Congress shall have the authority to collect taxes, to pay the debts of Mexico, provide for the common defense of Bosnia and provide for the general welfare of every nation on earth. The Constitution is only as good as the people who administer it. And in this case, this particular section doesn't work at all because of the politicians we've got. To borrow money on the credit of the United States, I'll give them that, they can do that. Now, this next one, this is, this is section three. This is the one that they use to outlaw firearms and everything else they can get their greedy little hands on. To regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. <clears throat> There's nothing in here that says they can regulate an item that has moved in commerce years after the fact. In fact, you'll find a really good case, which is also mentioned in here, the Schechter poultry, poultry case from 1935, where the Supreme Court said is if this idea that, that Congress can use interstate commerce to regulate anything, it will leave the states no authority whatsoever. And that's precisely what's happened. There are federal laws on the books right now that a century ago, half a century ago, would have been unthinkable because people back then recognized Congress did not have the authority to regulate in a lot of the areas that they are regulating in. To establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. Well, on naturalization, I believe we had amnesty a few years ago for people snuck across the border. <coughs> and as far as the subject of bankruptcies, the reason this was put in by the Federalists 
had nothing to do with protecting citizens. It was to protect the banks and financiers because what had happened at the time, now let me take you back a little bit prior to the enactment of the Constitution. We had a war with Great Britain that lasted from 1776 to 1782. And of course, what everybody forgets today when they think that people on our side can butt heads with the federal government and helicopter gunships and tanks and B-52s and fighter bombers is that there were these two little minor details everybody has overlooked since then. They were called the French Army and Navy. Uh, when Washington beat the British at Yorktown and Saratoga, it was not because he was a superior general, it was because the British were trying to offload their supplies, gunpowder and cannonballs and things like that, to reinforce their troops with, and while they were in the process, a French fleet sailed in, they wound up in a three-day running gunfight. Both fleets got sucked out to sea. And by the time the British got back, Cornwallis had to surrender because what was happening is that Washington's troops had heavy ordnance. This is the same thing that happened at Lexington and Concord. Everybody thinks the British were up there because of handgun control. Uh-uh. What they were after was not flintlock muskets and pistols. What they were after were cannons. And what happened at Yorktown and Saratoga was uh, the American troops had dug trenches in and they put their heavy ordnance in. And every day, they were moving the trenches with their heavy ordnance closer to the British lines. Well, the British had heavy ordnance too. The problem is they had no ammunition for it. And so what was happening is the British were getting pounded, literally pounded, and they couldn't defend themselves. And after about two or three days of this, uh, General Cornwallis just figured, well, you know, it was either he had to surrender or everybody was going to just be pounded to death and commit suicide. We don't have that today. We have to use the legal process. You know, this idea that anybody on our side is going to stand up and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a regular army is patently ridiculous. I was in the regular army. And let me tell you, 30 years ago, 33 years ago when I got out, there wasn't any militia group anywhere in the country, even today, that's a match for what we had in a regular army over half a century ago. And it's not necessary. You know, if it ever, oh, the other thing is too, while I'm on that subject, before I get to the next thing, is that uh, uh, there's a book called The Art of War by Sun Tzu. And what he points out is, and I see a couple of people nodding their heads, is that physical force is the last thing you use. You only use that when the enemy's completely demoralized and disorganized. I mean, if you go in right off the bat, you know, you're not dealing with a full deck. Now, the reason that the subject of bankruptcies is federal is because if it hadn't been, and see, the Federalists put one over us on this one, is that because at the time you had 13 separate states only before the Constitution was enacted, they were actually 13 separate nations. And you see a lot of this stuff about people saying, oh, well, you've got the small U in the United States and the, and the big U. Well, it's very simple. Before the Constitution was enacted, united was an adjective. Uh, after it was enacted, it became a proper noun, okay? In other words, they were simply describing a confederation as opposed to what later became a country. Now, what would happen is, is if bankruptcies were adjudicated by state legislatures, and again, this was put in here to protect the banks and financiers, is what would happen is if you had a state like Iowa during the Great Depression, 90% of the farmers lost their farms. Well, the states could have passed debtor relief laws can't do that here. And the experience, I mean, somebody should have seen this one coming and they didn't. Here's what happened. 1782, the war ended. All right, 1783, we go back to trading with Great Britain. Problem is, then as now, we've got some of this NAFTA type nonsense in which we send raw materials out and we get finished goods back in. Well, the value of a product depends not only on the value of the raw materials, it depends on the labor that went into it. So that by late 1783, and we've just been trading with Britain for a very short period of time, all our raw material is going to London and the London merchants, and the finished goods are going to the colonies. And when they get to the colonies, the seaboard merchants would send the British products into the interior. And the merchants in the interior would then sell those products to the farmers. And the farmers, because most of this country consisted of subsistence farmers at the time, they would take and they would pay for those goods in agricultural products. 
And the merchants, the local merchants, would then take those agricultural products to the eastern seacoast and sell them there. Well, the problem that they had was with this. That system worked fine for a matter of months, but then all of a sudden, what the London merchants discovered is they had a three-year supply of American raw materials. They didn't need anything else, but the finished goods were still coming over here. Today's equivalent would be a, uh, oh, let's say $10,000 of the iron ore. I mean, you're talking a mountain of iron ore going to Japan and one Toyota automobile coming back. And what happened was is that the London merchants then decided that they had to have payment in specie. And so they told their suppliers on the American East Coast, uh, you know, no more of this. Uh, we've got to have payment in gold and silver. So the East Coast merchants then told the local merchants out in the boondocks that we have to have payment in specie. And so then the local merchants, because they didn't want to go belly up, they then told their customers, the farmers, we have to have payment in specie. Problem is, they changed the rules of the game, and the local farmers didn't have it. They were planning on paying for the products with agricultural products the way they had already, always done. So to make a bad situation worse, and this is always where it winds up, the, uh, the local merchants started t suing the farmers and taking away their farms. Some of these guys had gotten these farms during the Revolutionary War, and what happened was there became a tremendous revulsion against lawyers, merchants, and speculators. The term's starting to sound familiar? You see what's happening right now in this country with NAFTA and all this other nonsense? Anybody here actually read NAFTA? Okay, there's one. Anyone else? Okay, you need to read it because it's 1,700 pages of special interest legislation. Even name some of the companies that they're looking out for. I've read about half of it. Uh, so the result of this was because of the court proceedings, and they weren't anywhere near as crooked then as they are now, they had various rebellions, Shays Rebellion being the most famous, and uh, Captain Daniel Shays, uh, as a matter of course, would surround the court buildings with troops of his own rebels, and uh, they would run all the judges and lawyers out, and then they'd go in and burn all the records. And it didn't do him much good, but his rebellion ended in 1787, and as a result of his rebellion, uh, the first thing George Washington did as president on July 4th, I believe it was 1791, uh, he signed a protective tariff. And what you're going to find, and the reason I'm using this to illustrate this, is that whenever you have a set of laws, and the laws <clears throat> are not developed by people with common sense, or who will not learn from history, those laws are going to create problems. Now, for example, uh, China. You've always heard of it as the land of famine. They've always they've got millions of people in past centuries uh, that have died from famine and that. Well, you're going to find 99 times out of 100, it's because of government policies, not because the peasants were stupid, but because the governments decided to tax in seed corn, and the Chinese left over didn't have enough seed for the next season, and so, of course, they all starved to death to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and, for, and a foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures. Uh, you'll notice here, it doesn't say anything about gold and silver at this point. In other words, the federal government has never been obligated to make gold and silver money, though some people will tell you different. To provide for the punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin of the United States. Uh, I don't think we can, you know, I know a lot of people say Federal Reserve notes aren't money. But you notice they take them real quick at the grocery store to establish post offices and post roads. Now, the only reason that they had this in, in uh, 1789 is because the only organization capable of moving mail and getting it there reliably that had enough force to do it, because you had a lot of people running around there. You had Indians, you had bandits, you had all sorts of people who were not behaving themselves. The only organization strong enough to do this was the United States Army. We don't actually need this anymore, but it's, you know, we still have it. To promote the progress of science and useful arts for securing, by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. This is the patents and copyrights. And if you want to learn about patents and copyrights, uh, the section that you go to is United States Code. You go to, you go to uh, Title 17, and you'll find it's a book only about that thick. It'll tell you just about everything you want to know about patents and copyrights. What the book doesn't tell you, you can pick up a telephone and they'll tell you there in Washington, D.C. 
Uh, it's a fairly simple area of litigation. To constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court, and they've definitely constituted some inferior tribunals, let me tell you, okay? <laughs> but what Congress actually can do is they can create a whole new federal court system if they wanted to. Anything under the United States Supreme Court, uh, Congress has the authority to create, and they also have the authority to destroy. To define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. Well, every nation on earth has laws against piracy, and uh, let me warn you how far piracy goes. If you happen to be down in Florida, and you sneak up and steal somebody's houseboat, it's a federal crime, it carries 99 years, it's called piracy. Better you should steal something on dry land. Uh, to declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water. Uh, well, letters of mark and reprisal obviously are no longer with us because no private citizen can afford to build an aircraft carrier and prey on shipping. To raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that you shall be for a longer term than two years. And the reason they have the two-year limitation here is because armies in England had a tendency of once you would put them together, they would not voluntarily go back apart and uh, they would say, well, you know, we haven't been paid. Uh, the English had a lot of problems with that under Cromwell because once he had won the English Civil War, he had all these soldiers who would not go home. And that's one of the reasons we have this particular section, to provide and maintain a navy, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. All right, now, here's where we have a problem. To provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. Now, the militia... provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. Now, the militia in this section does not have the same meaning as militia in the Second Amendment. And this is where some of the confusion comes in. But even if it did, all right, let's say that all these courts were correct. The, the militia was actually the National Guard and the Federal Reserve and bodies of troops like that. The obvious question is, is that when our militia, or our National Guard, or our reserve units were in Kuwait, the obvious question is, were they there to execute the laws of the Union? Were they there to suppress an insurrection? Were they there to repel an invasion? This all applies to the United States. In other words, if the courts are correct, then what you would also have to look at is that any time that reserve units were sent overseas, it would be a violation of this section of the Constitution. Uh, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining 
the militia, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states respectively the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. Well, supposedly, the, uh, the states can appoint the officers, but you're going to find nowadays states can't control them. All uh, the president has to do is pick up a telephone and tell the uh, head of the National Guard in any state in the Union, you're now, you've now been federalized and he now has a new commander in chief. Uh, we're, uh, this next one I'm going to skip because it concerns the, the District of Washington, D.C. to exercise exclusive jurisdiction uh, legislation in all cases whatsoever over such a district not exceeding 10 miles square, etc. Well, a lot of people in the patriot mythology movement will tell you that what that means is is that the federal government does not have any authority outside of Washington, D.C. in that 10 mile square area. The problem with this is is that when this was put in here, Washington, D.C. hadn't been acquired by the federal government yet, and after it had, this clause ceased to have any meaning. <sighs> now, this last one, this is called the enabling clause. To make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution and the government of the United States or in any department or, their, or officer thereof. In other words, what they were trying to tell us back then, which they've lost sight of, is that if the laws are not authorized by the Constitution of the United States, they are null and void. Here's your problem. When you pass an unconstitutional law, who is going to actually say it's unconstitutional and do what he's paid and sworn to do? And if you think it's the federal judiciary, which they would like to have you believe when all these people in their black silk dresses up there uh, looking down on us mere mortals are trying to say that, well, we protect the Constitution. I'm going to tell you right now, that's so much crap. And let me prove it to you out of Bowden's government by judiciary. One of the things Bowden pointed out, and uh, when I read it, I thought, you know, this makes absolute sense. He said, if you think for one second that federal judges are going to be the people who protect the Constitution, he says, number one, not only is that crap, but he also pointed out in 1932 that most of these disasters, like the Dred Scott decision, were the fault of the federal judiciary. He said, but to illustrate his point, prior to 1800, we had what were called the Alien and Sedition Laws, which I mentioned earlier. And one of those laws was is that if you criticized the federal government or the people in it, it was considered sedition. Now, when the First Amendment had been enacted just a few years before, if you'll recall, it said, Congress shall make no law, okay? And one of those was restricting the freedom of speech. That is exactly what the sedition laws did. And if you think about it for a minute, who enforced those sedition laws? Who sentenced people to prison? It wasn't Congress. I mean, Congress may have enacted the nonsense. There was not a single federal judge in the United States who ever took one look at the sedition laws and said, these are unconstitutional. I refuse to enforce them. On the other hand, uh, they enforce them to the utmost, like the bunch of black robe tyrants that they are. So anybody who thinks that the judiciary has changed from that day to this, uh-uh. If there is an unconstitutional gun law, if there is an unconstitutional drug law, if they have an unconstitutional anti-abortion law, in case you hadn't noticed, these federal judges will enforce them to the hilt. And the reason they will do that is because they're not there because they believe in something. They're there because they're a bunch of power-mad, arrogant, incompetent lawyers. Uh, just recently, William Reinquist was whining to Congress about Oh, these judges could make more money in private practice. Well, maybe they could, but if they did the same thing in private practice they do on the bench, they'd all be in federal prison. Next section we're going to go to here, and then I want to get into the, uh, the Bill of Rights here in a bit, because that's going to show you, once you understand how the Bill of Rights is supposed to work, uh, once you have the basic concepts, then what you can do is you can go to these jurisdictional statutes and say, okay, I can see where they violated this particular provision of the Bill of Rights, uh, and I can then litigate it. But you've got to understand how this thing is supposed to work, and it's also helpful to understand how it's really supposed to work. Bowden's book will teach you that. Most, oh, incidentally, you can get that book, even though it's, it's real pricey, from um, some outfit, I think, in New York, John Gaunt and Sons. 
Uh, you can get it on interlibrary loan. It won't cost you anything. Uh, we finally decided we had to buy a copy because the third time we took it back to the library and I was only up to page 400 and I was still in the first volume, I realized this was getting to be a nuisance. It was cheaper just to buy it. Uh, section 9, a lot of this doesn't really have anything to do with us right at the moment. The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended. Well, on the contrary, they, they do it all the time. Uh, no bill of attainder or ex post facto law. Bill of attainders, you better look that up in Black's Law Dictionary because that's, that's a hard concept to explain. Ex post facto. Now, one of the things I'm going to give you at some point here is I'm going to show you how to get in touch with what's called the Selden Society. Anybody here ever hear of it? Okay. <clears throat> ex post facto. The, the first time this term arose, back in about the uh, 13th century, the beginning of the 13th century, uh, a knight had raped, I believe it was a 12-year-old girl. And about six weeks after uh, he'd raped her, there was a statute enacted. I believe this was by uh, Edward I. It was around 1290. And what the statute said was, is that if you rape someone, uh, you're going to hang for it. And so they took this knight to court. They filed a criminal complaint against him. And uh, the, <clears throat> the knight says, wait a minute, you've got a problem here. And they said, what's that? He said, well, he said, I admit what you're charging me with. He says, but at the time, it wasn't against the law. There was no statute, so you can't do this to me. And you'll find this in the uh, Selden Society's reports. And so they basically, they had to let him go. I mean, they didn't like it, but they had to let him go. And that's where this started. The Constitution of the United States, something you've got to be cognizant of, was written in the language of the English common law. And there's only one source to find out what the English common law was in 1789, in 1791, uh, in times previous. And that's the Selden Society. It's in London, England. I'm going to, hopefully, the next hour here, I'll write the address up for you. And what the Selden Society does is they do research and they, they print old law books from centuries ago. That's where I read about this case. It was from the, what they had done is they had translated this case from the law French. It was an actual court record that was put down about the year 1290. And they, year by year, they try to update these books because, again, everything's in law French up to the year 1500. And if you have a question about what the English common law was, because in the absence of statute, the common law controls, our Constitution was written in the language of the English common law. And ex post facto means the same thing right now as it did in the 13th century, in 1290 AD. Uh, they have some other interesting things that they'll tell you from the Selden Society. For example, they had a case in uh, 1264 AD, rather long-running case. It's a civil case, some kind of real estate squabble. Would anybody like to guess when that case ended? It's a long case. Any guesses here? 1264 A.D. Well, Harvey, that's a good guess, but there's only one problem. A century, that's correct. You've got it right the same. That case is still being litigated today, 700 and some odd years later. And you think you got problems in this court system? <laughs> okay. No, they've had cases in England that have literally gone on for hundreds of years. I mean, that's how bad their court system is. That's the court system we've got. <laughs> All right. Uh, a lot, of our, uh, a lot of our court system actually uh, was not based. Now, now the Constitution, now be very careful here. The Constitution is written in the language of the English common law, but we did not try to adopt the English system. Because the English system, for example, their parliament, there's one example in the Federalist Papers where they point out that the English parliament, because the English parliament could change the Constitution, didn't have to be done by the common people. Well, one day they changed it so all of them would serve another four years in office. In other words, everybody that was elected for four years, they all got into Parliament one day and said, you know what, we're probably going to get thrown out in this next election. Let's just change the rules here, and uh, we'll all just vote a change in the Constitution to extend our uh, tenure in office another four years. And they actually did it. So that's not the, not the system we have. We do not have the English system. What we have is that the language of the English common law controls. And when there is a principle that you will not find in the Constitution or in our statute law, 
then and only then does the common law control. Uh, one of the Selden Society's um, uh, little squibs concerned a case that was litigated somewhere here in the United States. Nobody could find the principle until they went to the Selden Society. Incidentally, the Selden Society is mentioned in Supreme Court reporters. Federal judges know who these people are. They're mostly academics. And uh, anyway, the, uh, <coughs> the Selden Society located a case from something like 1664 with the controlling legal principles, and that's how the case was adjudicated. So if you really want to be thorough in your understanding of constitutional law, you not only have to go back to the source documents of the Constitution, but you have to read the history, and if you join the Selden Society, Society it's only 50 bucks a year, and they send you all kinds of goodies. Uh, we've got like a couple of hardcover books that you can't get anywhere else, one of which had this 1290 ex post facto case I was describing. Well, actually, I'll try to get this up here on the board for the next hour. Now, uh, let's see here. We've got uh, regulations of commerce. So oh, I'm trying to look here. They're talking about no titles of royalty. You know, that, that would be fine, except that we've got all these people with sovereign immunity, which was never there in the first place. In uh, Section 10, you're going to find there's a, that's the, um, oh, let's see, what is this here I'm looking for? Uh, you, they can't pass any law impairing the obligation of contract or grant any title of nobility. Well, law impairing the obligation of contract means that once you have entered into the contract, the state can't pass a law. But if you haven't entered into it yet, the state can pass all the laws it, want, it wants, and then you basically have a problem. Uh, Article 2 is the executive. We don't need to pay a lot of attention to that. Uh, Article 3, that's the judiciary. Uh, you're going to find that Article 3 and Article 4, uh, Article 5 and Article 6 have, uh, you know, they still have a lot of um, uh, relevance today. But Article 7, it's simply concerned nine out of the 13 states voting for something, and that's toast. I mean, you don't even need to worry about it, uh, even though it's a fairly comprehensive section. Article 3 determines how judges are supposed to act and so forth. And notice this, everybody thinks that federal judges are appointed for life. Nothing is further from the truth. They're only appointed for terms of good behavior. And the fact is, right now, almost every one of them is misbehaving. I just read you one, uh, Ms. Rudy Brewster. I mean, 100 years ago, this guy would not have survived 20 minutes on a federal bench. And today, you know, it takes 20 years, and he's still there. Uh, Article 4, this is the Full Faith and Credit Act. And uh, let me warn you about this one here. This is going to get nasty. Remember the part in Hawaii where they just ruled that, you know, homosexuals can marry each other? And Congress has passed an act saying, you know, we're not going to recognize that. I'll guarantee you exactly what's going to happen, just like it did in Colorado in that last rather queer case they had out there called Romer versus Evans, is that when somebody enters into a contract in Hawaii and they litigate it in federal court, some federal judge is going to rule that the Full Faith and Credit Act applies because full faith and credit simply means that the judgments of any state court or state legislature or whatever you've got in one state must be accepted as valid in the other 49 states. You lose a case in Hawaii, <clears throat> you've already lost it in Missouri because the courts are going to uphold it. You want to yeah, finish this up, Peter? <clears throat> Just real quickly for the benefit of the audio tape audience. If you want to hear more, Michael Brown is on satellite radio. The satellite is GE1. It's transponder 7, 103 degrees, 5.8 wideband audio. And he is on 6 p.m. Central Time, Monday through Friday. Gee, I remembered it. Amazing. We are going to take a short break. We have to spin the video and cue up the next tape. Uh, take 10, we'll open the doors, uh, stay close, and we're going to uh, drag at least one more out of them. Thank you very much.
All right, what we're going to do here is I'm going to go to Article 5 and Article 6. We're going to start on the Bill of Rights. Uh, if there are any questions, because we're going to have to apparently break up this little tea party at 635, uh, I would like you to start lining up any time you feel froggy uh, and want to leap in, because once I'm through with this section, I'm going to turn uh, my part of this over to uh, four of my senior officers that I've already introduced you to. Probably won't get to them till tomorrow morning. I'm going to let them do their thing, and then Dwayne Rogers is going to take over. So if you've got questions, I need them now, okay? In other words, if you've got any more questions, just start lining up here. Uh, I will start talking on this, but if you have questions, get up here and let's ask them. Now, Article 5. Article 5 concerns how you are supposed to amend a constitution. You are not supposed to amend it by judicial construction. And those of you who've already got this little booklet here, which I strongly recommend because you're going to find it'll fit in a shirt pocket. It was designed to replace the citizen's rule book that's been out there for about 15 years. And the judges took them a while because, you know, they're not too bright, but they figured a way around it. Uh, you'll notice today that jury nullification is a subject that judges are very familiar with. And the first thing they do is they ask someone, do you, are you a member of such an organization or do you believe that you have the right to nullify a bad law? Over a hundred years ago, a federal judge would tell a grand jury, uh, when you, before you indict one of your fellow citizens, ask yourself, did Congress have the authority to enact this? Today, we don't have laws enacted by Congress. We have suggestions. And what uh, Justice Harlan pointed out in 1910 is that he had seen constitutions. He was talking about state constitutions also. Uh, amended by means alone of judicial construction. He was also talking about statutes. Now, the thing with Article 5 is, is that you're supposed to be uh, two-thirds of the House uh, shall deem it necessary and proper, shall propose amendments, then it has to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. And you're going to find there are all sorts of statute laws on the books that were not put to us in the common herd the Congress merely by legislative enactment amended the Constitution. So here you have a Constitution that's supposed to be amended by the people that first gets amended by legislative enactment and then gets amended by judicial construction. So what we wind up with is, isn't even recognizable uh, at the lower end. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up, even though you all know it, is this. Most states also have provisions for amending their constitutions. And if you think that the federal Congress has got some dumb people in it, let me introduce you to some of these state legislatures. You'll find, for example, most state legislatures have a provision, Missouri being one of them, New York being another, I believe, that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And in Missouri, the only authority given by the Missouri State Constitution to the legislature is to regulate the wearing of concealed weapons. Notice I said wearing of concealed weapons, not possession. And the Missouri State Legislature, in its infinite wisdom, decided that that meant that anybody who had been in prison, who'd had a felony conviction, could only own a firearm that you couldn't conceal. It had to be at least 16 inches long. That is not what the Missouri State Constitution said. Now, in Missouri, there are other states that have this provision. We haven't done a complete search just yet, but I think you might want to look, those of you who uh, get into this, pick out your state and go look for it. Remember what I told you about that declaratory relief petition that you can have a jury decide the law instead of a judge? No one in Missouri has ever taken this provision to court and demanded a jury trial as to whether or not that particular legislative enactment by the state of Missouri is in fact illegal according to the Missouri Constitution because it was not passed by referendum, it was passed by legislative enactment. And again, on the state constitutions, you're going to find quite often that your state constitutions are actually better documents than the federal constitution 
your biggest problem, as they, they pointed out in the Federalist Papers <laughs> over two centuries ago, is that you can get a uh, federal constitutional infringement well, adjudicated in the federal courts. You may get adjudicated, get it adjudicated wrong, but at least it can take place. And nobody seems to know how to do this in the state courts, which is hopefully what I'm teaching you here. Uh, next, we're going to go to Article 6, which is the supreme law of the land. Uh, obviously, I'm going to have a question for you. If the United States Constitution is the supreme law of the land, all right, all other state judgments or whatever notwithstanding, let me ask you this question. The Fifth Amendment is as much a part of the Constitution as any other part of the Constitution. You'll find uh, Supreme Court decisions going back for two centuries on that. This is the same Supreme Court that said that the indictment of grand jury clause of the Fifth Amendment does not apply to the states. Now, the question is not whether it should or it shouldn't. The question is this, is if a state judge takes an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Fifth Amendment indictment by grand jury clause is part of that Constitution, where does the state judge get off upholding what they call a prosecutor's information? No court has ever adjudicated that. I'll tell you something else they haven't adjudicated. There's a fellow named Sheldon Hansel up in New York. Now this, this was my case. I'm the one who ran him through it, okay? You'll find it in the 70th volume of the Federal Reporters, third series, page six, case from last year. In the last year and a half, I've had four decisions published one of them was, it was a lesson in how not to do things. I didn't read one word on a statute. You'll see it in 903 Fed Sup. I forget the page number. And it's called Simpson versus Reno. You'll see my name there. You'll see Peter Simpson's name there. I did not read one word in a statute. And we got clobbered. In other words, it's how not to do things. On this one here, what happened was, one of the issues we raised, now we, one of the issues we raised, we won. Another issue, uh, we lost, but here's the way we lost it. We had raised the issue that indictment by grand jury has to mean now what it meant in 1791, what it meant in 1806, what it meant in 1903, all right? And that Congress had no right to amend the Constitution by means alone of legislative enactment. And the rule that we were squabbling about this federal rule of criminal procedure, not civil, criminal, okay, was rule 6D, or 6 dog. And the reason we'd raised that is because, as usual, as, as any of you who've had any experience at all with federal criminal law know that the grand jury system has become a complete shambles. It's a total farce. <coughs> It absolutely fills, fulfills none of the functions that it did originally. And the reason is, is because of this rule here, Rule 6D. And what it says is, is that the attorney for the government may be allowed in the grand jury room. Now, this was not permitted in 1681. There is a real good case, it's, or rather, it's called Remarks on Colleges Case, College in Shaftesbury. Uh, London grand jury refused to indict them. Charles II had another grand jury convened at Oxford, which duly indicted them. Shaftesbury fled to the continent. College, who didn't have the, the money to get out of town, was beheaded. And what Sir John Hall, Solicitor General of England, pointed out was, is that government attorneys have no business in the grand jury room. Now, this was in 1681. It was a principle at the English common law. In 1791, this was still the law. In 1806, when the United States Attorney for Kentucky asked a federal judge to convene a grand jury, which a federal judge can do, the federal judge said, okay, finally, he got badgered into it. He convened a grand jury. And as soon as the grand jury was convened, Joseph Hamilton Davies, the United States Attorney for Kentucky, asked to attend the grand jury in their room. You'll find a complete account of this 
in an article titled, it's a law journal article titled, Demythologizing the Grand Jury by Professor Helene Schwartz. It's in the 10th volume of the American Criminal Law Review, page 701, it's from 1972. And what Helene Schwartz pointed out was, is that the very idea of a grand jury, which has two functions, number one is to make an investigation, but number two, which is the more important function, is to shield the citizen from the awesome machinery of the federal government because it's real easy for somebody to get gaffled up on political considerations. And uh, We've got a gentleman in this room, Staff Sergeant E6, Ed Gadelli, police officer from Pittsburgh. It's exactly what happened to his father. The United States attorney made a political choice to indict him, set a perjury trap for him. He fell in it. He's in a federal prison. As late as 1903, when a government attorney got in a grand jury room, and you'll find this in the Japanese silk fraud cases out of New York from that year, the federal judge quashed the indictments. He said, no, he said, I don't care if these people did any harm or not. You do not allow government attorneys inside grand jury rooms. Now, that was the issue we raised. The issue we raised was whether or not Congress had the authority under the Constitution of the United States to change the mode of proceeding in, in a grand jury without submitting it to the people. They did not address the issue. What the Second Circuit Court of Appeals did, and the type of, of usual judicial cowardice that we've learned to expect from these people, is they said that the defendant's claims, because this was a criminal case, United States versus Sheldon Hansel, the plaintiff's claims have no merit because Rule 6D says, and these mindless parrots then repeated the language of the statute. Remember what I said about federal judges will uphold anything no matter how unconstitutional? Because they're not accountable. And so what we did next was we turned around and we sued the Second Circuit. And we feel that the, the le very least they can do is, I mean, these miserable judicial weasels, the very least that they owe us is to address the issue we raised, not an issue we didn't raise. And sometimes this goes the other way. For example, um, uh, I had a case out of North Dakota. Oh, this is going back over five years ago. And what happened was is that uh, these two people were busted for theft of grain or some silly nonsense. It was a felony conviction. They'd been to trial, got convicted. But what I noticed was is that on their uh, prosecutor's information, they had more than one statute that they had been charged with. Now, if you ever get charged in a federal criminal case, look closely under each count. Because if you have two separate statutes, one of which contains elements of which the other doesn't, for example, if they charge you in Title 18, Section 371, conspiracy, and Title, Title 18, Section 2113D, bank robbery, under count one, and a jury comes in and finds you guilty of count one, well, they've got a problem there. Because nobody can tell whether you were found guilty of the conspiracy, the bank robbery, or both. All right, it's called duplicity. They're supposed to throw an indictment out for that, even though these judges have been watering that down also. Uh, you're going to find that in the civil courts, you can still book a winner. They're only about 90% corrupt. In the federal criminal courts, uh, I'm going to tell you right now that you're only there to build a record for the appellate court because your fellow citizens, by the time they get down to selecting the average jury, you're dealing with 12 people without two brain cells to rub together. They're going to convict you because the judge is going to help them. Uh, anyway, this case up in North Dakota, what happened there was, is there were three judges on the panel, and I talked to the fellow that I'd done the work for, and uh, he, sa he said when he was up there, is two of these judges were addressing issues we hadn't even raised on the appeal brief. And the third judge kept saying, what about this duplicity issue? Well, I was setting them up to take it into federal court on what's known as a federal uh, habeas corpus for state prisoner statute, Title 28, Section 2254, and my two people won the case based on issues and that we never raised on facts that never happened. Okay? I mean, they actually will do stuff like that if you scare them bad enough. Uh, Article 6, that pretty well covers that. Now, let me get into the, uh, the Bill of Rights here. Again, remember this was given to us by the, uh, the Anti-Federalists. 
uh, as Patrick Henry said at the convention in Philadelphia, he smelled a rat. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Well, that's what they did earlier, like I showed you, but that's because the Supreme Court has been making laws left and right regarding establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And when they meant peaceably assemble, obviously that, that still has the same meaning today, but to petition the government for a redress of grievances in 1791 didn't mean you wrote a letter to your congressman and he didn't respond. It meant Congress would give you a hearing. We don't have that anymore. Article 2, or rather Amendment 2, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, the courts have rewritten this to read a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the militia to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's not what it says, as a lot of law journal articles will point out that the word people had the same meaning in the first and fourth amendments, the right of the people to be secure in their persons and so forth, so it pretty obviously had the same meaning in the second. And unfortunately, because of judicial construction, that's no longer true. Article, or Amendment 3, that's quartering of soldiers. I'm not going to cover that for the simple reason that it hasn't been a problem. You'll find that the fewer problems that the courts create for us under these amendments, the fewer court cases there will be. Uh, under the Third Amendment, it really hasn't been violated by anybody since the war between the states. So you basically find maybe five or six cases there. Amendment 4, and this is the one that, this spawns an awful lot of civil rights litigation. Because, and when I get through reading this, I'm going to explain that there's more to it than just walking. Five million.
Chester is Mount Vernon High School to pick up our tapes. Feed the bird. Public access at Mount Vernon High School stinks. My last words were, tell Jeff Crisella and Dr. Turner, I am going to own their houses. This is a porous excuse for public access. Time is noon 08 p.m. Miles is 97. The next errand is Manhattan. But let's go take Rusty to Cheater South's house. Give him his lunch. And more water. Thank you. 
It's a booty. It has the old burn. Okay, now we're coming down to Cheater South. Godfrey S. South. This is where Ackerman came from, this house. Floor, the mother and the son moved down to the first floor. South did that so he wouldn't have to put a kitchen in up there and so that he wouldn't have to uh, put in a fire escape. Now that's a hoax because when they aren't looking he just may try to rent the third floor again. I saw Rosa, her husband's gone to the doctor in his old Cadillac. And he keeps saying that he's in pain and he wants to die. Isn't that awful? And Josephine and Tommy had just left for somewhere. And I saw Alfredo. I didn't see Ray, who brought Ackerman to the neighborhood. And it's 1.30 p.m. and the mileage is 99, and we will head for Manhattan. Excuse me, it's 12.30 p.m. This is the lunch hour. And Alfredo doesn't know anything about Sam, where Sam is. So we'll take the cross county to the digging over underneath the Rich Washington Bridge and down the west side highway. We came in on the Cross County folks and we're leaving on the Cross County. The Diggin, Route 87 South to Manhattan, 233rd Street. Van Cortland Park, Bronx Net. We went there a week ago Monday. That is good. Layman College. They're too expensive. I don't like Italian cookies that well. They aren't sweet enough. They don't have enough flavor. It's uh, 48 p.m. And here it is, 1.22 p.m. George Washington Bridge. What an awful tie up.
people homeless and hungry. I got out the money.
a neat little alley. Comes right out onto uh, 59th. This is where we're going. p.m. mileage is 117. Here's ELA where we used to make commercials. Public access producer I ever saw. What's your name? Travis. Travis? Where are you from? Where? From New Jersey. And he came out, folks, he took in a load of three-quarter inch, and he came out with a load of three-quarter inch. Good for you, Travis. Thank you. What part of New Jersey? Uh, North American. Is that cable vision system? Yeah. What route are you what route do you take out to go over there? I go to the tunnel and then I take uh, One oh nine north. One and nine north. One and nine north. But uh, right now the new road is construction. Is it building a bridge? So I exit off on Kennedy Boulevard. Kennedy and, Boulevard. And that goes to Cable Vision. And uh, if you want to go to Cable Vision, you would have to take Kennedy Boulevard to Forty First Street. Okay, Kennedy Boulevard to Forty First Street, and then make a right and take it down to Park Avenue. And then there's Cable Vision on Park Avenue. What town is that? Uh, Begins with C. I believe it's, um... Yeah. I think it's, um... Uh, it's on the Weehawk. What is it? Weehawk. The one I'm thinking of begins with C. C? Yeah. Cray something. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank you. I've got to go over there. First I have to go to Brooklyn, and then Queens. Then I'm going over to New Jersey. Uh, what do you do? Well, uh, at public access. It's all public access. Oh, I see. Yeah, I, my, my sister uh, is a reverend. Oh, that's She's wonderful. Oh, good for you. So I run the tanks here. I, we have a business in New York City, so they let a lot, and at least the whole building, so they allow me to access here. Oh, okay. I'm trying to get New Jersey by me. It's tougher, believe it or not. Well, listen, can you sign my application? I have to have a local person sign it. What do you need? I'll get it for you. Wait a second. Galeno. He's fascinated about driving through Manhattan as long as he's not in the car. We are at 59th Street and uh, West End Avenue. Actually, 12th Street, 12th Avenue. See, that's the uh, highway we came down, straight ahead. Do you see it, the Henry Hudson, West Side Highway? And if you get off at the right exit, you see you'll come right up the street. Now, I can show you CBS now. Let me make this left, it's down here two blocks. It's an old burn. Here it is. See the billboard, see that squatty building? That's CBS. Dan Rather. So called morning show. Right there. It's really not much. This is where the production is. offices were at 52nd and uh, 6th Avenue. 
pretty good up to 37 miles an hour in Manhattan. out and New Jersey. Franklin and I had a discussion that we will make Tuesday will be Long Island Day as always. And then we'll Instead of making Thursday Aaron's Day, we'll make Friday Aaron's Day, and we'll make Thursday Telephone Day. We used to have to telephone on Friday because the office is closed for the week by 5 p.m., so you move that ahead and make Telephone Day Thursday. Yesterday it did 50 telephone calls plus. Those are the calls to find people to the funds to advertise on TV. And then competition with cable this. So yesterday you did 70 red calls, 28 green calls, and 50 regular calls. And took away that debt that we hadn't been able to do because of moving and many other crises. Wasn't that woman brave to come all the way over from New Jersey to hand her tapes into Manhattan? And little Travis, he was so cute, carrying a great big three-quarter inch. So, Franklin and I had that discussion, and we decided now that Friday will be Aaron's day, Thursday will be telephone day. Convention Center. Remember when all of the trade shows used to be at the Coliseum at 59th Street, that street that we were just on. Twenty-third Street. It goes over to the FDR.
see all these people who come to church on Sunday morning. Isn't that nice? And that's the parish. Parsonage. Lord, we give you thanks and we give you praise for the way that you have touched these people's lives through the ministry that they have shared. We thank you for the ways that they have been ministered to and the ways that they have ministered. And we pray, Lord, for a powerful outpouring of your spirit that comes from the witness that they share upon the work that we do here at Hopewell in your name. Thanks be to you. Amen. Amen. are nine games ahead. from the trees. Well, don't get me. There's Alex. My cousin is in the window. Okay, right. now stand by. Wait a second. Hold still. Let me get my picture. Okay, now I've got to stay with the plane. Okay, you ready? No, wait. You don't want to be in it. You stay still. Okay, I'm going to give you a countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Are you ready? There he goes. Ah, oh, I know it. He gets stuck in it. Whoa! I have to wind it really hard, so when I um, throw it, it stays in the air long. Oh, I 
Rusty. Hi, Rusty. Did you put the plane together? Yep. You assembled it. Okay, now stand by. You ready? Do you need me to count down? Yeah. Five, four, three, two, one. Uh-oh. Folks, uh, in all the ugliness that's going on, here's some beauty. Uh, now, this is not a commercial because the sale is all over. But look at these different kinds of grapes to show you how wonderful God is. Look at that. Cardinal grapes. Red globe. Superior. Italia. Black seedless. Lady finger, Christmas rose, exotic, red flame seedless, queen, Thompson white seedless. The names aren't important. What's important here is the variety that God comes up with and the beautiful earth upon which God uh, lets us live. Isn't that something? As I say, it's not a commercial because this sale is all over. Next thing is uh, the Universal Evangelistic uh, Ministries attacks Cablevision uh, for keeping the truth away from you, the public. And this is a letter from Reverend Dankins to Maurice Cunningham. That's not high enough. So I took the letter protesting Cablevision censorship of the truth to the public. I took that and uh, annotated it and sent it to Charles Dolan. He's the person who has to know. Maurice Cunningham is just a, another part of Dolan's toy army, a little toy soldier. Uh, here is the Bernard Matson, who does everything he can to cover up and bury the complaints that the public makes against judges, judges in the district court, the United States District Court. And he did everything he could to cover up my complaint against that screwball, uh, Michael B. Mukasey. And so finally, they had to file it. You know what I said to them. They had to file it. And in saying that they had to file it, which is right here, I told them that they could learn a lot from other circuits, that they make a mess of everything. And they could learn a lot about from other circuits about filing a complaint for judicial misconduct. That's Title 28 U.S. Code, Section 372C1. And this one was against Gerald Rosen. So the Second Circuit makes you fill out, fill out a complicated, burdensome form. And when I wanted to make a complaint against Gerald Rosen in the Sixth Circuit, this is all I did, folks. I wrote to the circuit. I says, I've got a complaint, and here it is about Gerald Rosen. And that's all there was to it. And they processed the complaint. So the Second Circuit has a lot to learn. Uh, this is another New York City parking violations, uh, civil repo, another uh, illegal document, illegal summons, look at it. It's not even legible. It's $55 and it's the fault of Domingo Martin, a sadist 
who tortured me for two hours on renewal of my Brooklyn Cable TV public access. And because of him, I got this $55 parking ticket. But that's not the issue. The issue right now is how legal this thing is. But I will send him $55. It's a civil recall. And I will send it. Shame on you. Get a job your progeny can be proud of. When are you going to? When are you going up to $100? The civil recall statute is Title 18, U.S. Code, 1964-D. Now, Michael Brown This is his address, by the way, folks. Sent me this. And that terrible judge, McCalla, you remember how he tortured William and Celeste Budrow? Okay, finally they've got an investigation going on him. And this comes from the Memphis, Tennessee paper. And I must read you. Uh, the in fact infractions of this judge from the newspaper Okay, everybody, uh, this was written by Lewis Graham. The Sixth Circuit investigates misconduct allegations. A prominent defense lawyer retained by the Sixth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals is pursuing allegations of courtroom misconduct against U.S. District Judge John J.O.N. McCalla. M-C-C-A-L-L-A -L -L of Memphis. Cincinnati lawyer Martin Pinales has contacted potential witnesses and indicated a disciplinary hearing could be held late next month in Memphis, sources said. Should it occur, the proceeding conducted by a panel of federal district and appeals court judges would be unusual if not unprecedented in Memphis and could lead to sanctions against McCalla. Let's see if we can get a picture here. The first inkling of problems between McCalla and the appeals court surfaced in a sternly written rebuke 16 months ago in which the court ordered an embezzler resentenced by another judge. In the intervening months, at least one disciplinary hearing was scheduled but did not occur, sources said. Pinales, whose clients have included noted lawyer F. Lee Bailey, would not comment on any involvement in the McCalla matter. Uh, declining even to confirm his hiring by the Cincinnati-based appeals court. I'm not permitted to speak about whether I am or am not contacting witnesses or potential hearings or anything, unquote. McCalla also declined comment, citing a judicial canon requiring confidentiality. The Sixth Circuit is responsible for policing judicial conduct within its four state territory and has been peppered with complaints that portray the 54-year-old judge as erratic and obsessed with courtroom ethics. 
<clears throat> According to a March 2000 appeals court decision, McCullough spent nearly four hours sentencing the embezzler. Much of the time was devoted to haranguing her lawyer about his ethical responsibilities and conduct, the court said. Amid the scrutiny, McCalla last month grabbed an Atlantic lawyer by a lapel of his suit and pulled him about one foot through a doorway toward his chambers, letting go after the lawyer protested, according to one source familiar with the incident. The lawyer had not wanted to enter the chambers without a court reporter present to record the conversation. Only Congress can revoke the lifetime appointment McCalla received in 1992 from President George Bush, but federal, federal law allows appeals courts to strip errant district judges of their caseloads or even force them into disability retirement. The Cincinnati Appeals Court and its chief judge, Boyce E. Martin Jr. of Louisville, just ended a contentious legal battle with a Michigan bankruptcy judge over attempts to remove him from the bench due to tax troubles. Rarely do problems with federal judges get to the point of requiring a hearing, said University of Mississippi law professor Ron Ry Richleck. Usually when the court perceives there to be a serious problem, it's a matter of talking to the judge and it gets resolved that way. The American Judicature Society, which collects data about judicial discipline, cites fewer than a half a dozen recent instances in which federal judges were reprimanded. Among them, in 1998, U.S. District Judge John McBride of Fort Worth was reprimanded and stripped of his docket for a year. A Fifth Circuit Judicial Council found McBride repeatedly verbally attacked lawyers and other court personnel without justification. The court transferred all of the judge's cases to provide time for self-appraisal in deep reflection. In 1992, U.S. District Judge Alan A. McDonald of Yakima, Washington was publicly reprimanded for exchanging notes with his clerks during courtroom proceedings. The Ninth Circuit Judicial Council concluded the notes could be reasonably interpreted as reflecting bias. Among them was this note penned by the judge during testimony of a Mormon witness. In my experience, a Mormon money man makes the Jews and Chinese look like rank amateurs. In 1998, U.S. District Judge James Ware of San Jose was reprimanded for misrepresenting himself in numerous speeches and interviews. Ware often said his passion for the law and justice came from watching his brother die in a 1963 Birmingham racial attack, but the Ninth Circuit found the judge was not the brother of 13-year-old Virgil Ware, as he repeatedly claimed. The first complaint against McCalla surfaced more than a year ago when the appeals court reviewing a routine 1999 sentencing, concluded it involved into a, quote, lengthy harangue, unquote, against the women's attorney. The court said it could find no evidence of this, but it took the rare step of ordering the woman represented by another judge, suggesting McCalla's action had the unfortunate effect of creating the impression that the impartial administration of the law was not his primary concern. When that opinion was released, Martin, the appeals court, 
the appeals court's chief judge, that's Boyce Martin, uh, told the commercial appeal a judicial review committee had been impaneled that would examine McCullough's behavior, not performance. Because the law veils the work of the committee, it cannot be determined what, if anything, has occurred since Martin's public comments. Under federal law, the committee hears evidence and makes a written recommendation to the appeals court. The court then can take action, including dismissal of the complaints, censure, removal of the caseload, or even a forced disability retirement. It could not be determined how long Pinales has been involved in the case though sources suggested it had been several months, nor would the specific nature of his assignment be determined. This is the commercial, the name of this newspaper is the commercial, and it's Sunday, July 15, 2001. So, uh, this attorney uh, uh, was in touch with William Budrow, and William Budrow told the attorney that McCalla had put William and his wife Celeste into jail for one week because they wanted to be pro se. They wanted to be pro se, and so he sent them to jail and wouldn't let them out until they got an attorney. And the lawyer investigating this said, what? Did that really happen? Can you give me the case number? Well, it really happened. Can you imagine putting people in jail because of their exercise of their constitutional right to be pro se? That's what McCullough did. And they were abused terribly in jail. Uh, first call for you to hear chat with Glendora is the New Mexico court, the clerk. Thursday, 5.03 p.m. Hi, Glendora, this is Debbie. I can't remember when I talked to you last. I don't have, uh, the last return of services I had was on August 3rd, and that was for Judy Grace and Multinomac. Um... No other returns have come in from the marshal. Let's see, on the 14th of August, I got a motion to dismiss by, hang on here, I have to look, um, uh, Brooklyn Com, Oneida Coward Myers, no, wait, wait, that's a lie, 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 I'm sorry. Wait, let me see here real quick. It's, um, Cable Vision Systems, Dolan and Dolan and, a um, few of the other named people. They're called Group Gamma Defendants. Uh, they did a motion and uh, memo and stuff to dismiss. Um, that was done, like I said, on the 14th. Other than that, I don't have anything. Um, hopefully next time you call, I'll be at my desk. I doubt it, but maybe. Um, have a good one. Bye. Now, you see, Cablevision made a motion to dismiss, Debbie said. I have not received any copy of the motion. That's how dirty and how cheap. Dolan and Cablevision are. Friday, 10, oh, a.m. Hi, Glendora, this is uh, John Jaffes, uh, returning your call. It's good to hear from you, and I'm looking for a waiter. Um, that's to you and Franklin. Now that uh, list of towns was not in the uh, mail, and so I'll have to come over there myself and find these towns. And uh, I would have come yesterday, uh, August the 17th, uh, but by the time I got through with Yonkers, White Plains, Port Chester, Harrison, 
uh, the uh, uh, Manhattan, uh, Queens, and Brooklyn. The time was all used up. I started at 6 a.m. I got home at 8 p.m. So I'll have to make this another day. Uh, and that's soon, I hope. Uh, the uh, youngest public access producer I ever saw was at Manhattan Cable TV yesterday. An eight-year-old boy carrying four three-quarter inch tapes and then bringing back four into his car and they happen to be from New Jersey. Uh, we call them, is that right? And I asked her if she knew about you and she didn't seem to know about you, but she wants to get in touch with you. So that's the way it stands. I will have to come over uh, on a day and leave early and go there first and get this thing straightened out because there's much information the public over there has to know. Okie doke. Uh, Bob and Joan named their firstborn son after her father. Guess what they called him? Pop. This is to Karen Heck in charge of public access, northern New Jersey. Remember when she was in Yonkers, what a crackerjack she was? She's terrific. Uh, folks, I want to introduce you to my signer uh, in the uh, Brookhaven system, Cablevision Brookhaven system, the old TCI system. On. And uh, a Cablevision changed my time slot in Brookhaven, and instead of telling me about it, uh, they tell uh, Mr. Paul about it. I think that's screwy. I think everything Cablevision does is screwy. Anyway, here is Andrew Pollan with some interesting information. I'll talk to you soon, I hope, sometime. Bye bye. Hi, how are you? Okay, I got a call from Patty at Cablevision. Yeah, that's right. And that time slot that you wanted wasn't available. That's okay. What did they get? They well, they'll go either later or earlier, and I didn't know what you preferred, so. That, yeah. Well, that's okay. Which do you prefer, the earlier slot? What was it, you know? I think they said, what did you ask for, 10.30 originally? Uh, 10 or 10.30, uh-huh. 30, then they had an 11 or a 9 or 9.30. Oh, 9 to 9.30. Okay, 9 to 9.30. Oh, that's good, yeah. Okay. That's good. We'll call her back on Monday and let her know that. Oh, she said you could wait until Monday? Yeah. Okay. It oh. doesn't start till September, so... Uh, no, I think it starts October, doesn't uh, it? Oh, okay, she said, yeah, that I had t enough time to get, in get back in touch with her. Oh, that's good. Oh. Well, thank you for taking care of that. So, uh... Or, now, now, that message that you were telling me, I'm afraid it, uh, uh, it does uh, show a little commercialism. Okay. Uh, can you give me another message that is, uh, uh, without commercialism of any... Actually, one minute, did you have a fax number? No, uh, but... Consumer, when they go into a optical place, and they should be look. They should be asking questions and being treated as if they're patients. Okay. Okay. And when you are a patient, you have the right to to understand what you're getting. Okay. Okay. That that's the thrust of what I'm saying is that they they should be asking questions that they would normally be asking their doctors and and knowing what products do what for them. Okay. Well, folks, this is Andy Pollan who is giving us uh, good information. Uh, that's good, Andy. Okay. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, what is your middle initial again, Andrew? And Neil. Andrew and Neil Pullen. Right. And it's spelled P Paul O L A N. O L A N, right. Yes. Yeah, that's good because when you go in as a patient, you have rights. 
That's right. That's, and although it's a very commercialized uh, field now, 